pleased and honored to introduce my friend, our keynote speaker for this afternoon. And there are a lot of notables when it comes to Mr. Aponte. He has been the San Diego County Librarian for just over 10 years. He runs a library system with 33 libraries, 33 communities, uh, two bookmobiles, and a literacy program. His operating budget is about $34 million. And as a previous public library director myself, I know that with an operating budget that size, he needs to build and sustain a strong team and staff to be successful. He needs to be responsive to his community and to his staff. And he's a natural when it comes to this. During Mr. Apuente's time as a professional, he has distinguished himself with many awards. San Diego County uh, recognized, was recognized as the Library Journal Library of the Year in 2012. That's quite an achievement. And Mr. Aponte was recognized by his alma mater, Bard College, yeah. New York State, which is a private uh, college um, founded in 1860. I even looked it up because I didn't know where it was. <laughs> but it faces the Hudson River and the Catskill Mountains, and it's such a beautiful campus, beautiful. He was given the John Dewey Award for Distinguished Public Service, and this was in the spring of 2013. He received the Reforma 2004 Trejo Librarian of the Year Award at the ALA Conference in Orlando, Florida for outstanding library work, locally and nationwide contributions to Reforma and the promotion of Latino culture. He was greatly honored by this recognition. In all of his positions, he has built new libraries, even in fiscally difficult times. He has expanded relevant social services and built collaborations with many of his communities uh, within San Diego County. On Facebook, he regularly posts pictures of programs he attends, and it's very evident that he's rarely in his office, and, <laughs> and he's a director with high visibility, and he's known in his communities. <laughs> Mr. Afonte is passionate about what he does. He believes that libraries have the power to transform uh, communities. He fully understands the complex role that libraries play as a catalyst in building community and adding value on a global scale, but also on an individual scale. He truly believes that libraries change lives. He understands and uses technology to achieve his goals and delivering services to his constituents. He is relevant. And when I think of Jose's service ethic, I think of the California Library Brown Act that was passed in 1953. And this is the act that now in cities and counties and commissions, we have to do our business openly. We have to post agendas or whatever. But there's more to the Brown Act than just that. Um, it, halfway through the preface, and, um, and, and I'll quote here, and it says, the people of this state do not yield their sovereignty to the agencies which serve them. The people, in delegating authority, do not give their public servants the right to decide what is good for the people to know and what is not good for them to know. The people insist, and I love this last statement here, the people insist on remaining informed so that they may control over the instruments that they have created. So really, we are instruments of the people serving them. And we don't tell them what to do. They tell us what to do. And that's, that's such an important thing. And Mr. Aponte truly understands and lives this every day. He knows that the library belongs to the people and the staff and their public servants. Instead of living in the past or staying in the past, Mr. Aponte embraces tradition and culture and uses these elements to move forward in delivering services. There's a lot more about him. Uh, you can go to the San Diego County website and look up his biography, and it's pretty lengthy. Um, and there's a lot that is done. And also, you could read his service philosophy, which he might talk about some of that today. On a personal note, I want to say that I was a mentor to Jose Aponte's son, Tony. And Tony is here today. Um, who graduated from UCLA Library School. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> and as one of his mentors, I was at his library graduation to see him receive his degree, and I was very, very happy to see that. And how great to see that Tony comes from a library 
with the library tradition. Jose enjoys running, biking, endurance sports, and he takes such great photos. And I'm always asking him, Jose, can I have permission to post one of your pictures on my, uh, you know, as my uh, screensaver or whatever? Because I love, I love his pictures. Anyway, Jose has been a friend uh, of the uh, Diverse City Council for many years, and he has spoken for us in previous events. He spoke at our Diversity Recruitment Summit in 2006. I first met him when he was at Oceanside, maybe about 16 or 17 years ago. Um, and even though I don't see him that often, I consider him a friend. Um, and I always enjoy hearing him speak, and I'm sure that you will do this afternoon. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Jose Alba. Boston 
in the, uh, 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 the, the marathons I've done, most interesting is that they, they, they corral you by people that actually have your time. So normally in a, in a marathon, there's a tide. It goes up, it goes down, you get uh, this person slower in the beginning, faster, and not at Boston. The person that you sleeve with a corral will be there at the finish. You know, wonderful thir 13 miles to open, she starts downhill, you're feeling you own the world, and you start to hit the rolling hills of Boston. And the, 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 the term that comes to mind when I think of Boston, relentless. They just don't let up. It's hill, 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 hill. Uh, and then there's Wes Wellesley. Wellesley? Oh, oh, that's funny. All of the young uh, uh, students, it's predominantly a uh, 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 woman's uh, 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 school, Gosh, they just hug you, and you're like, yeah, Grandpa! <laughs> Boy, yeah! <laughs> Wellesley was fantastic. The hills, you're working, working. Heartbreak is a long hill. Two to four hills. You're, you're on a heartbreak. Is this the end? The spectator looks over at you and says, yes. This moment, is this heartbreak? And she says, yes, part of it. Mm. <laughs> 20 miles, 21, 22, um, you're inside out. You see the Sitco sign, which is by their stadium. I'm from New York, Yankee fan. I know they have a team in Boston, and it's important to them. But uh, <laughs> whatever their stadium is, uh, Red Sox. Red Sox. Uh, you go by Sitco, and you think, geez, I'm getting there. Two to four miles. I mean, I'm, I'm in. You come down, and you, you turn left on Boylston, and to the right is the prize, Boston Public Library, and to the to, to the, the the viewing area, and to the left, where all the public is, families, people line up. You're coming through. Now you've been at this, in my case, three hours and thirty-seven minutes, and it's an important uh, number in the story. You push through with three thirty-seven. Now I had wanted to run three twenty, but that's a runner story, and you don't need to hear it because runners never are ever happy with anything they ever do. That's a universal. <laughs> I could have done better, but it rained. I could have done this, but it did. I had it. it, it, it. Push through three thirty-seven. <sighs> wow! Pictures, pictures. You go through the line and say, "No, I don't want to pay for that picture. I am just too cheap." <laughs> so I have my running vest and a running vest, they have the hydration, and I have my camera through it. And this is in 2013. And it, it, it's changed, Corral, for, 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 for uh, a marathon. Push through the marathon, finish in the medals. You have your medals, and I see a family. And I see a, a, a family, a Latino family, in the shoots. And I think, how cool connection, a dad, a mom, two kids, a Latino, doing a marathon, would you take my picture, please? I hand him the ca camera, he shoots a picture of me, and I'm like, yeah! If you guys on Facebook, you see me. I hand it to somebody, boom, thank you. Hey, bueno, así somos, está bueno. I mean, you're, you're finished, you go through it, you get your juice, you get your uh, uh, juice, uh, you got a little goodie bag, and a, a block and a half away from the finish line, which is where uh, the Boston Public Library is. It's behind me now in the story. We walk a block and a half. There are school buses with 30,000 people's gear, because when you start, it's freezing. So they get the little sweatpants in. So you go up to your school bus. They're all lined up. I'm at my school bus, getting my bag, and I hear, boom! I look back at the finish line, and I see smoke coming up from the finish line. And as the smoke emerges, I hear a second sound. Boom! Smoke coming up from the finish line. There's three of us getting our gear. Uh, my age group, generally, I mean, you run together, same age group. I said, Jesus, that sounds like a bomb. And they said, no, no. I said, I, I, I train on Camp Pendleton. That's what it sounds like, ordinance. We turn to each other, we move, get our stuff, and walk out. The police in the shoot. Now, they're never policemen in a finish line in a marathon. It's all volunteers. All of a sudden, there's two or three policemen walking through the chute, and they're all like this. Something's up. I've been a library director for a long time. First thing they do when something happens is they try to calm everything down. You go through the 
the shoe, you're out, and uh, there's a British lady next to me, and that comes, I know I'm from, I'm, I'm pardon me, but uh, <laughs> I don't do a bad British <laughs> And everybody just walking like this. Uh, uh, I, I know I'm from Brittany. I know what the call bomb sounds like. A call bomb sounds like an actor. Oh, uh, I, uh, excuse me. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> pardon me. But that's the kind of day it was. I train on Camp Pendleton. I see people training. I hear ordnance. And I hear someone who has heard a car bomb. And there's a fog of war because no one says anything. No one knows what's going on. You get through, you're trying to use the phone, you're calling, you're trying to call Cynthia, you're walking like this. Nobody's getting through to anyone because all the phone lines are, are loaded up. No one is running towards the event. We're trying to get to safety. We get to the park and it escapes the name of it, uh, probably two and a half miles from Boston. I'm trying every number in that phone, and I get to my sister and Florida. My sister gets up, hey Joe, how is the marathon? Oh, great, 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 Gloria, turn on the television. Tell me what's going on. She gets, turns on. Just a minute, Joe, just a minute. Turns on the TV to CNN. She says, Joe, get the fuck out of there. It was a bomb. Get out. And kids are skateboarding towards the park, and you're trying to be calm. You get Meet your friend. Somehow we connect. Uh, another fellow I was running with on the phone. Six hours to an airport. At the airport, um, six hours of getting on a plane, lines, every darn TSA you could ever imagine. Uh, you're sitting on the plane, and I start to write because this is uh, an absolutely uh, uh, it, the word terrifying, uh, frightening experience. I'm a librarian. I'm a runner. I have, when I was little, I went hunting once or twice. This isn't my neighborhood. I, I'm, I'm really frightened. On the plane, I start to write, and I, what, what, what? You, there has to be a learning. What is the learning? What, 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 what? And I, I looked back, and I could see the finish line, and I could see where the bomb went off was on the side where my wife usually waits for me at the end of races. There's a podium and everything for the people that pay, and then there's the, the normal people. And the normal person that I saw that day, my wife wasn't there, was that family over here that I had asked to take a photo. And to this day, because they have never really published what happened to the people that are injured, I don't know if this family um, was made, what happened to them. I have no idea. Um, uh, they were not part of the. You know, I, I always look to see who got killed. Um, they were killed. And that learning was that I wanted to live with the Boston Public Library. That my life was this. My life was this passion. And I was a little boy. And growing up in New York City, and I'd say, Mom, I'm bored. She'd say, Joe, go read a book. Mom, I'm bored. She said, Joe, go get your tennies and go outside. On the plane, that was my epiphany. My job, my passion, was to be part of this world of ideas, of knowledge, of, of truth, the right to read. Serious uh, 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 emotional ups and downs, and by that, uh, oh, I'm gonna get you because you can't get me, and, and I got through it because of my commitment to libraries, truth, learning, wisdom, and what we're gonna spend some time on. My friend Tracy just got back from uh, Tracy Hall's fantastic Spectrum Scholar, and Tracy and I. Uh, she, she's aware of my Boston uh, Marathon experience. And, and she wrote this, uh, and I wanted to share it with you. And we're going to get to the libraries, but there's been a lot of libraries.
very tall so far. Come on, yeah, yeah. No te apuras. Todo biblio Bastante. Ni te apuras. Es bastante. Ah, let's see. Just back stateside, and finally able to think about something perplexing me, the dividing or comparison of allegiances in the face of tragedy. Let's not give in. Those of us committed to the fight against racism, neo-colonialism, xenophobia, classism, and other forms of false human separation have to see the traps. We must stand for love against hurt everywhere, every time it happens, Beirut, Ramallah, Dar Salaam, Garissa, Nairobi, Baghdad, Dominican Republic, and our own neighborhoods and Paris. So that's what motivates me. I love people. <laughs> this epiphany that indeed I was committed to this because of a safe place. I was committed to this because of the, the notion of a sanctuary. Uh, I was committed to this because I'm interested in power. Two people that have influenced me over the course of my work, and this is really difficult to cover this material in 30 minutes. I won't give it my best, but I have been a librarian four decades. I've been a library director two decades, and I've been a deputy city manager three years. There's a lot of ground to cover, but let's give it a try. Um, Emilio uh, Ablonghetti, who is uh, the, the, the state librarian of Chile, and we, we uh, shared the podium once, and he said uh, this, and it really set uh, um, my, my frame of mind. Every day when you librarians open your doors, you are involved in an act of social responsibility. Uh, my Spectrum scholar, uh, we were there at the beginning. Elizabeth Martinez from this library, Los Angeles Public, she brought Luis and a number of us together, and we thought Spectrum up, and we brought it up in one of these boardrooms. Uh, uh, Kafari, fantastic. I'm interested in libraries because I'm interested in power. And if in one sentence I could sum up my philosophy, that's it. I'm interested in empowering communities to take control over their own lives. So social change worldwide, let's say a couple of uh, uh, quick uh, articles. Oh, guys, we got so much time. I think we're like at 15 minutes. So. <laughs> we got a lot of time. L.A. Times, the xenophobic thing. Oh, L.A. Times, this is Friday, November 13th. The dark history of U.S. mass deportation. Uh, in the Eisenhower era's uh, operation, that uh, one that was spoken about, the candidate uh, who remains unnamed at this point, uh, the Eisenhower era operation deported close to 300,000 people, uh, 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 according to historians, and was accompanied by scores of deaths and shattered families. Uh, from the front page of the Los Angeles Times, headlines, uh, in, in, during the period uh, headline, wetbacks herded into Nogales camp. U.S. halts border invasion, reads another. Set this up. L.A. Times editorial, September 4th, 2015. It's tempting to treat Donald Trump's claim that Jeb Bush should set the example by speaking English while in the United States it's just another bigoted remark from a presidential candidate who infamously refers to Mexican immigrants as rapists. But the Times editorial frames it. Even if one believes that immigrants should become fluent in English, shaming citizens or politicians for speaking Spanish isn't the way to accomplish that objective. On the contrary, just as sensible bilingual education programs smooth the integration of immigrants, so does a recognition by politicians and political process that sometimes it's appropriate to deal with U.S. citizens in a language other than English. Social change. We get to the PowerPoint, Joseph. I never have technical difficulties with my PowerPoint. <laughs> Change 
and social change for purposes of oh, my library. That's where I would go, but I won't stick it in there. Uh, social change, and the source of this is the uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. The uh, social change, the alteration of mechanisms within the social structure uh, by, uh, uh, by changes in cultural symbols, rules of behavior, and social organization. And I'm going to break our conversation into three uh, separate... Uh, come on. <laughs> uh, and by that, institutional, structural, and personal uh, change. So when I, I speak, I, it, it, it's fun. It's really fun to talk about this. Institutional, I'm talking about how your library interacts with the world. How the library changes the world. And, and I'll have a, a complement of, of, of uh, examples on, on most of it. Structural inside the library. How do you change the structure of your library? Uh, directed libraries, West Palm Beach, Colorado, a couple of Californias, deputy city manager. I got a few insights. And then personal. How is it that we motivate ourselves and our co-workers to value or values um, that indeed in, in, in embrace change? Structural. Uh, you, you've heard enough of it this, this uh, morning, well, afternoon already. Despite recent diversity recruitment, ranks of uh, management, administration, and library are notably lacking uh, in African American and Latinos. This is one that just amazes me. I've been a library director for 20 years. Well, think about the major American cities. Um, there have been five Latino directors for I don't know how long. That's just long thought. You, you, have. you, you got the Miami and, and so Ray's not there anymore. Uh, you got San Antonio. You got me. You got Luis. Um, and, and then you have uh, Jerry Garcon up in Oakland. And that's ridiculous that we should be able to name the big city Latino directors every single time I give this talk for 20 years. That's ridiculous. There should be more than I can name or remember. Oh, and there's Carmen Martinez uh, uh, up north, um, and she's in retirement, non retirement. So, five or six of America's major cities, uh, it, 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 it exists. So, so structural. How do we change that inside of our organization? First, large organizations are suppressive in nature. It is difficult when you come from a background where it is, in Spanish, when I grew up, dale respeto, hijo. You give respect. So when elders come in, we gave them respect. We listen. Well, in an aggressive, in your face society, that's pretty difficult. Um, so the large organizations are suppressive, so then we work to decentralize. We empower branches. We empower principal librarians. We empower collection development. We decentralize that power and authority. We teach them, hey, it is easier to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Everybody in my organization knows it and uses it. <laughs> we need participative management, truly participative. Anybody can come in at any time, come up with any harebrained idea. Uh, it, that's, uh, you fly out there. Someone mentioned uh, a bunch of responsive. I answer every email that has been ever sent me in my life, and I have some real nut jobs. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay, a systems thinking. This idea that it isn't, uh, in, in my case, the Del Mar Library. It's the Del Mar Library and the Portrero Library and the Fallbrook Library and, and the Imperial Beach Library. And if uh, it or my program doesn't work here, why don't I hand it to Miko at El Cajon and see if she can? Systems thinking. Right, we're talking about social change. This is the structure inside libraries. Uh, continuous open door. Uh, you hit it that enough. Uh, we need intergenerational solutions. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the teenagers and computers uh, a, little, uh, a little later. Uh, uh, at, at, uh, how we built the computer center. Um, but in short, 15 year old uh, key to me, who was a student learner, and said, Hey, uh, one day, you know, the, the seniors don't know how to use the computers. And, you know, we really should have classes. And could we, you know, sh sh shouldn't we? And I said, Maria, you want to teach the class? <laughs> yeah. Intergenerational solutions. Um, and a certain amount of what we call calculated risk. Um, <laughs> transparency, 
Uh, on my particular organization, there was no communication vehicle uh, from uh, executives uh, to, to, to uh, the librarians and the rank staff. Um, so we publish every executive team meeting's notes. Everybody reads it. They know what's going on. And uh, they stay engaged. This transparency. Um, uh, uh, during the recession, that, that, that no one gets fired. I don't know that we have much time, but structural and transparency. 2008 to 2012, great recession, and libraries closing all over uh, the country. I moved from a uh, 43, it was actually 46 million dollar budget at, at the height, to 32 million dollars during the base of the recession. Our CIO told us, look, what you guys have to know is you have three years or two, I, I can't recall exactly how much it was at the time, to get to that 32 million number. And we sat down with staff, with our representative employees, we, we sat down with admin, and we noodled what we could do in this emergency situation. And I'm talking about transparency, structural, how do you change an organization, how, how do you change? And we approached uh, uh, staff and, and we said, well, you know what? Uh, a bunch that wants to see everybody. And we were spread all over, so I had three days of retreats with staff. The staff, the staff opened up and let them know. We're going from 42 million, uh, 46, uh, we're going to go to 32 million. And the reason budgets differ like that is you have an actual budget, and then you have the, the budgeted a lot. So budget, all of my students are coming up. Budget is a plan, right? I plan to spend $500,000 on the house, but you actually end up spending $750,000. That's the actual. So when I say 46, 42, they gave us 42, but we knew the actual was 46. Going back. Here's the plan. We're going to cut the book budget from $6 million, this is an actual story, uh, to $750,000. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. But the good news for us is that we're going to put together a hiring freeze and no one gets fired. Look around the room, because no one in here gets fired. How are you going to do that? How are you going to do that? You leave that to me. They asked me to get from 46 million to 32 million. We're going to do a hiring freeze, and we're going to recreate the work. And we did. We spent an enormous amount of money and time on technology that freed staff in up to bare bones levels, um, change the face of the building, uh, and built uh, what turns out 2012, 2013 to be the library of the year. Uh, long story short, uh, in recessions, uh, budgets go down and they go back up. We're currently at the 34 on the books, but our real number is $42 million. It comes back. Uh, no one got uh, fired. Our book budget is at 4.25. Our actual book budget this year is 5 million. You've got to have, and it's in the body of the talk, when I got this structural, you have to have a strategic approach to work. You can't just like, oh my God, because this is what happens. Administrators come in and say, Abonte, I need to feel the pain. You have to close a library. It's, it's really cool that my wife is here because these are, yeah, 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 these are lonely at the top. And you say, that may be all well and good, but I'm not signing that budget. Because structurally, I am signatory authority. That's what you are. You are a political appointment. Point T. And with that comes statutory, statutory authority for that department. So I am only going to sign one budget. And the budget I'm going to sign is the one I committed to that staff over here. So why don't you and I, now I'm all now getting into how do you actually do the change down in here. Why don't you, these are the, why don't we both go home and sleep on <laughs> you don't confront them. You say, let's think about it. And people reason. The following morning, there's a conversation, and you get closer to it. Uh, structural. Transparency. Oh, jeez, there's so much, guys. I don't, I don't know. The community of practice, again, structural. 
uh, you spend time and money on people. Uh, when I came on board in uh, San Diego County, we sent two people to ALA, uh, standard now, 12 to 20. Um, uh, th these are penny wise and pound foolish things. You've got to be able to say to your city manager, well, not this matters. CLA, uh, any CLA you've ever been to, there's 22 to 26 Cal uh, uh, San Diego County Library employees. Um, we send them, we invest in them, they matter. Uh, this year, Rural Librarians Association, uh, um, the, uh, the Black Caucus, uh, the, the, the Conference of uh, Librarians of Color, Reforma, um, Enlaces on the Border, invest in your staff. Structural. And they know it. They know it. Um, and yes, there's real constraints. We don't just send everybody with like a you know, visa card to Kansas City. We actually take a number. It's $10,000 if you'd like to know. There's a transparency. We divide it by the number of people and we send everybody with 750 bucks. Hey, you take a little bit out of your, your pocket too. But we can deal with the front page when it comes. Oh, you're sending people to Vegas. Well, actually, we're only sending people to Las Vegas with $750. If you've ever been to Las Vegas for three days, that's not going to last very long. <laughs> uh, back in here, structural. I mean, this, is, this is a delicate place. Language matters. Mm. Conversation, I believe, is more important, but language matters. In our organization, we speak to people experiencing homelessness. We don't say the homeless. We, 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 and this came from the ranks up. And I learn every single day uh, from them. People experiencing homelessness, the humanity of our clients, of the people that use our library, versus, oh, the homeless. Ah, you know, Puerto Ricans, Mexicans, homeless. Really? Really? People experiencing homelessness. Um, our staff is just fantastic. Um, family literacy for the approach to literacy that's familial because the California State Library only funds literacy between one adult and another adult and that literacy has to be in English. <laughs> ah, my Family literacy. That's your workaround. Uh, citizenship, straightforward. Uh, LGBT, right? Bring it. QIA. Let the staff lead you listen to them. Uh, L, and you know, this is another one. If you're working on this one, structural. Don't be afraid to say the word lesbian and say it a lot because they're afraid of these words. LGBT, uh, LGBTQ, um, lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, uh, gender, uh, queer. Uh, intersex uh, and allies, which by the way, Mr. Murphy, I'm an ally. I'm a member of the ally group. We believe support uh, LGBT issues, and we're proud of it. So every time we use language, of a chance, a potential to speak about inclusion and why it matters. Uh, think strategically, we've talked about it, tactically, um, I'll walk the walk. And during that budget exercise, we're, we're uh, in th th a two-year span. The uh, library had a 26 budget, 26 uh, percent budget reduction, and I, you'll see the numbers actually they're, they're, they vary because I'm, I'm looking at the whole of the recession, 2008 to 2012. This is just a two-year section of it. When the budget was reduced 26 percent in a two-year period, administration was reduced 36 percent. So you got to walk the walk. You got to walk the walk. We're in the middle part here, in the structural change. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, circulation. And when I picked up, and it is truly, this is a fantastic library. We uh, circulated four million books when the San Diego County when I, when I started there, and it's eleven years now. We circulate now comfortably eleven to twelve million <coughs> books. And how did we do that? We empowered staff. Asked them, "What do you think?" And the staff said, I'm bumping. we got to get rid of these fines. The, the, the poor kids don't want to come back to the library because they can't afford the fines. I'm bumping. we got a problem. They don't have the money. Oh, yeah, yeah, I think I'll take that to the Board of Supervisors. No more fines. <laughs> Woo! So we thought about it 
it, we noodled, we noodled, we noodled, and we came up with Fine Free Friday. And yeah, so we actually we circulation staff, they know what they're doing. They had a circulation, so they they thought this one through. The last Friday of the month, fines are waived in the San Diego County Library. Everybody who uses that library knows last Friday of the month, I walk on me and leave it.
Let's do it. And with school lunch program, the school district pays for the lunch, they pay for the people that hand it out, they just don't pay for the lights in the room that you already have lit anyway. It's like taking a church that's not used Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and saying, hey, I'm going to use it. So uh, in our library system, there's 33 libraries, and it, it varies between 9 and 11 currently do uh, school lunch program. We have three that do <laughs> breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Wow. Now, I have an idea. Yeah. It, 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 <laughs> so now try to close that library. <laughs> change in the community that view of what the library is. Well, we're actually a school. We're a school lunch program. Um, so in the city manager's office, I, 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 I read a, 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 a book called, this is a really excellent book, Creating Public Value by Moore. And uh, it's a text at the Kennedy School of uh, 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 Kennedy School of Government. And I came away with these, these five tenets. What matters to the politicians? What matters to the citizens? Well, all the tennis people came into the library also. There are five things. Um, safe places. Everybody wants a safe place. Oh, crime, 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 Prosperity. Everybody wants a job. You hear politicians talk about that. Crime. Prosperity. Everybody wants a job. Uh, but three, health. It's huge, huge. Um, four, education. Uh... Uh, let's see, we got private and, and, and housing. Well, uh, housing, uh, housing uh, which is number five. So, one at a time. Safe places. Oh, geez, I thought this is when I was in the city manager's office. We're going to do um, midnight basketball. We're going to do midnight basketball three times a week. That's a great idea. How many times do we have latchkey programs in the library? Why don't we frame that? as a uh, safety program, as a latchkey program, as a program that makes communities safe. Um, teenage, boys, Latinos, that don't read. Staff came up with this one, Techno Book Club. I'll tell you what, Ponte, if we give these boys an iPad, a Nook, or a Kindle, they're going to read. We came up with, uh, I think uh, it's a Nook device, device, and I have led the club for 16 weeks. If this is quality versus uh, quantity, uh, safe places, after school, and I had the whole rainbow in my group, six to seven uh, young boys. And we read every month for 16 months. We read a book. But they love those devices. They love the sweat, and it's cheap. Cheap, $100 a Nook. That's cheap. I mean, you're talking $43 million. So safe programs, safe cities, prosperity. Uh, so what are we doing on time? Here? Ten minutes left? We got a lot. Five? Five. I could turn it over to them. They'll get, they'll get on rolling on you. They'll get on rolling on you because they're interested. Uh, okay, so it is fine. Um, prosperity. Uh, a while back, uh, my, my, my uh, as I go, my, my sister calls me and says, Joe, I'm going to lose the house. I'm going to lose the house. Whoa, 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 whoa. Get, a lawyer. Get, get a lawyer. Get, get an attorney. Get, get, Joe, Joe, you don't, you don't understand me. I'm going to lose the house. I don't have a job. I can't afford a lawyer. Got to do something. Get back to my management team. I said, you know, this is ridiculous. I mean, information, education, culture, inform, educate, inspire, entertain. I mean, we can't help people lose their homes. Let's work on this. Let's, let's, let's look at the legal community. Let's look at this pro bono work. And we came up with the housing collaborative plan, uh, the housing collaborative group, which came up with the housing clinics. And we first started moving the housing clinics, which is Trained pro, pro, pro bono uh, attorneys and uh, housing uh, um, counselors from uh, certified nonprofits. And they started at low income libraries. This is back in 2010, 11. Uh, and and uh, it still happens, but now it's, it's, it's all uh, online. 
And rooms were filled with people like this. You know, like this room, neighbors wanting to talk to attorney, wanting to get some advice on their loan. Uh, how is it that we can you know, keep that house? Yeah. Um, th 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 this right in here. Institutional. Have, do you make an impact at City Hall? Building sanctuaries, safe places, prosperity, education. Um, Universidad Popular, the Vista Library, a fantastic program with uh, Cal State uh, uh, San Marcos. Every Wednesday for the last, I wrote it down, I can't read this one. Every day, uh, every Wednesday for the last three and a half years, they've met at the Vista Library. Um, farm worker families, because there's a lot of farms and a lot of farming in San Diego, um, to study and engage uh, in civic empowerment. Um, they uh, were responsible for the library's involvement in Ayotetsni Apa and the movement de los 43 in Mexico. And I'm going to wrap it up to the best I can here. Um, in uh, 2014, 43 uh, Mexican students fueron desaparecidos. Right? Uh, the government and others said, well, it's just some overzealous gangs. It's just the drug lords. They've taken them away and the school buses have disappeared. Uh, we, the citizens, said, no, there's more to that. There's more to that. And we want answers. And we won't uh, be happy with those answers until we find the remains or what has, uh, what has happened to them. Uh, the families, and, and they are, they're, they're native uh, families from the south, um, the families couldn't get a voice in Mexico. And they noodled about this. And they said, we're going to the United States. We're going to the United States, and we're going to make sure uh, that our voices are heard. Oh, yeah. They uh, had three specific, three areas that they wanted to make for sure they impacted. California, Texas, uh, California, Texas, and the Boston area, where they knew there were, there were progressive pockets that could speak to the desaparecidos. Uh, and they approached the library, see we're now in November, they approached it in March. Um, they contacted staff because the library is known in San Diego, the San Diego County Library, as an advocate for Latinos, immigrants, a place that is safe. Okay, I'm, I'm on the top one, which is uh, how do we do institutional change? And they approached the library and said, we want to bring the Caravana de 43 to the Vista Library. We want to bring the Caravana de 43 to the Vista Library, and we guarantee that we will get the television, we will get the radio, you will have a fantastic event. And I, staff approached me and said, they're coming, they're coming on Thursday. Are you okay with this, Mr. Ponte? And I said, get a partner. Get collaborators. Because when that flyer goes out, <laughs> that was political change. How are you a successful director when you're a change agent in a conservative community? All of these partners, I'm just picking this up as a prop, uh, like the Cal State San Marcos, um, the, the Mexicano, uh, the uh, Maldiv, um, oh yes, of course, the uh, King Sabe Que Me Chichistas, and then in the bottom right corner, a little tiny, little, 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 they came to the States, uh, and they, they filled the library, they filled the meeting room, they filled the parking lot. It was one of those career moments for me, and the families um, spoke, and they spoke for two hours about the experience of the desaparecidos, their, 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 their sons, um, uh, their, their uh, colleagues, uh, it was just uh, colleagues, uh, their, their, their faculty spoke. Um, other students spoke. I mean, it was it was one of the most moving uh, evenings I've ever had as a librarian. They had the faces of the kids and the posters. 
And interesting, last week when I was in Mexico City, same movement, it's all over Mexico. Um, I, I stretch every night before I go to sleep. I'm getting older. My body's falling apart. I'm doing my yoga stretch, and I listen to the BBC. And my grandpa, Don Antonio, Puerto Rico, always listened to the radio. Right? And I'm stretching. Thank you. 